Okay, so <clears throat> let's start a new topic discussion that is skin cancers. It is a very important topic in dermatology and many of these people, they go to surgeon as well and uh, uh, the diagnosis has to be done in time and then the proper treatment is provided. Now in the beginning, uh, I want to give you some important information regarding skin cancers. Now, regarding the common type of uh, skin cancer, only three names are there. Okay, basal cell carcinoma, basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma. We also call it cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma and melanoma, or some of the book also mention malignant melanoma. These are the three uh, malignant tumors of the skin, and these are the topic of discussion for us under this class okay skin cancers but let's start with some pre-malignant skin condition in the beginning just have a look there what are the pre-malignant skin condition which can change into skin cancer later on actinic keratosis now actinic keratosis means if a person is exposed to sun for a long time, there would be some changes occurring on the skin. Some thick area, okay, some flaky areas may be formed and they may uh, turn into squamous cell carcinoma. SCC means squamous cell carcinoma. So we can say actinic keratosis is a pre-malignant condition for squamous cell carcinoma. Bowen's disease, okay. Bowen's disease is also known as carcinoma in C2 are a very early form of carcinoma in case of squamous cell carcinoma. So this Bowen's disease can also change into squamous cell carcinoma later on. Or in other word, let me tell even in a better way, it is already carcinoma in C2 stage. So it just had to cross that basement membrane, then it will turn into invasive squamous cell carcinoma. Erythroplasia of querat, okay? Erythroplasia of querat is another condition which is specifically used only for a penile area, okay? A penis or penile area in case of male. It is just like Bowen's disease in case of penis. So that means it is also a premalignant lesion and it can convert into squamous cell carcinoma of the penile area. It looks red, that's why erythroplasia. Leukoplakia is a white patch or white plaque. It is also important pre-malignant condition for squamous cell carcinoma. And dysplastic nevi, okay? Dysplastic nevi can turn into melanoma, melanoma. Now dysplastic nevi means, nevi are very common in all of us, okay? Most of us are having nevi. There are benign nevi, they don't do any harm to us. But if some of them develop dysplasia, they can convert themselves into malignant tumor. That is malignant melanoma or melanoma. Now, some of the pre-malignant condition have very high risk of changing this, themselves into skin cancer. Xeroderma pigmentosum is one of them. Xeroderma means dry skin. Pigmentosum means there are multiple pigmentation on the body. The patient exactly looks like that. And this person is actually, okay, has very faulty repair of the DNA. Okay, faulty repair or inability to repair the DNA damage, which is caused by sun. So if this type of people expose themselves to sun, okay, because of the ultraviolet ray, the keratinocytes would be damaged and they, have, they cannot repair themselves because of faulty DNA repair. So they can easily uh, you know, develop multiple skin cancers. All three types of skin cancer may occur in them, melanoma, basal cell carcinoma, and squamous cell carcinoma. Now, even immunosuppressed patient can develop skin cancer. One of the example is organ transplantation. After organ transplantation, the person becomes immunocompromised.
Now let's see some of the picture here. Okay. See this. This is <coughs> the actinic keratosis or solar keratosis. This is the effect of sun. Okay. Now in today's uh, today's class, the first half of the class you have studied this person. See there, he has hair loss here. Most probably androgenetic alopecia. So this is a bald area now. It is not covered by anything. So sun exposure or chronic sun exposure led to this type of problem, actinic keratosis. This is another picture. So both of them can develop into squamous cell carcinoma. Now another picture, see here, these are some plaque, plaque-like lesion, okay? Again, actinic keratosis, it can also develop like this, easily turn into squamous cell carcinoma. Even a close view, okay, this is a very closed view, a bit on the forehead as well as on the scalp. This is another one on the dorsal surface of the hand. This is another, uh, you know, exposed area, isn't it, to the sun. We usually do not cover that area. So actinic keratosis can convert into squamous cell carcinoma. Now, this is called leukoplakia. Leukoplakia it can easily turn or convert into uh, squamous cell carcinoma later on. And there are multiple risk factors for this leukoplakia. Alcohol, smoking, okay, beetle not chewing, and even sharp teeth or sharp denture, we call. These all are risk factors for uh, leukoplakia development inside the oral cavity, especially on the border of the tongue. This will also develop into squamous cell carcinoma. Now see that, this is called erythroplasia of querat. okay? It's a type of Bowen's disease actually, but this Bowen's disease, we give, uh, we call it by a different name, erythroplasia of querat. You can call it Bowen's disease, you are not wrong because both of them are uh, squamous cell carcinoma in C2. Only that specific term is used for penile reason. See this? This is erythroplasia of querat. Again, penile area, and you can call it a type of Bowen's disease also because this is uh, CA in C2. Till now, it has not crossed basement membrane. It will cross basement membrane very soon, and that is uh, called invasive squamous cell carcinoma. Now, all of these are pictures which tell us pre malignant lesion on the skin. Now, with this information, Let's talk about basal cell carcinoma now. Now, according to the definition, basal cell carcinoma is a malignant neoplasm which is arising from the basal cells of the epidermis. Now, our epidermis has got multiple layers. Okay, the lowermost layer is called stratum basal or stratum germinativum, then stratum spinosum, then stratum granulosum then stratum lucidum, and finally stratum corneum. But stratum lucidum is not present in all type of skin, it is only present in thick skin, okay? So in this case, basal cell carcinoma is arising from basal cells of the epidermis. This is a very important point. See here. Okay, let me underline this so that it will be easy for you. Now, there are different synonyms for basal cell carcinoma. It is also known as basal cell epithelioma, basalioma, or rodent ulcer. This rodent ulcer is a very important term. It is asked in different MCQ exam or different clinical exam also. Very advanced type of basal cell carcinoma is called rodent ulcer. Now, most basal cell carcinoma are caused by sunlight induced damage to the skin. So sunlight exposure play a very, very big role or important role. Okay. And among all three types of skin cancer, basal cell, basal cell carcinoma is the most common type. Most common type. Please mute yourself. Now, let's, let's talk about the uh, picture here. Look at this picture, okay? 
This is a very typical picture of basal cell carcinoma. It occurs on the facial region. This is already ulcerated form. The edges are already a little bit inverted, okay? And there is a bit of hemorrhage as well as necrosis can be seen on the base. These are other, other pictures of basal cell carcinoma. This is one, this is the other. One very important point in basal cell carcinoma is sometimes patient, they ignore it. They think it's a type of pimple, okay? Or a small infection on their face. But that infection doesn't disappear. It doesn't heal in time. And still they ignore. And sometimes the friends or the family member remind them, I'm seeing that uh, lesion for quite a long time now. Don't you think so? Are you not you know, aware of this? And suddenly patient, you know, oh, yes, you're right. And then they go to the doctor and the disease is diagnosed. This is the way. Basal cell carcinoma doesn't, doesn't kill the person. Remember that. It doesn't lead death. But it is mainly a cosmetic type of problem. Now, these are some other, okay, a little bit widespread or a little bit advanced type of basal cell carcinoma. Already necrotic tissues can be seen. Now, with this, uh, uh, you know, different pictures and we already have a bit of uh, concept. Let's go and talk about this topic in detail. Basal cell carcinoma occur predominantly on the head. Okay, almost 70% of the lesion occurs on the face and 25% occurs on the trunk, and about 5% occurs in some other parts of the body, okay? Like in penile area, vulva, or even perianal skin. But for the practical purpose, you can remember head, mainly the face is the most common area for basal cell carcinoma. Now, what is the etiology? Okay, let's talk about this. Now, the exact cause of basal cell carcinoma is unknown, just like any other malignancy. But environmental and genetic factors are believed to predispose the patient to basal cell carcinoma. Okay? Whenever we ask about the etiopathogenesis of malignancy, okay, you can always start like that. The exact etiopathogenesis is not known, but there are certain speculation, there are certain hypotheses. And usually, these two factors are common in most of the cancer, environmental and genetic. It is also true here. So, radiation exposure, okay. radiation exposure, this is through ultraviolet ray, mutation of the gene. Okay. Let's, let's uh, uh, give the heading first, and then we, we are going to explain one after other. Exposure to X-ray, especially the hospital workers, or the persons who are working in the X-ray department. Arsenic exposure. Arsenic is a type of metal. Immunosuppressive condition, okay, or immunodeficient status. Xeroderma pigmentosum. Xeroderma okay. pigmentosum, another condition which is a pre-malignant, and epidermodysplasia verruciformis. You have uh, heard this term in viral ward. This is the severe form of human papilloma viral infection, which can occur and that can give rise to basal cell carcinoma, okay? So let's uh, uh, discuss these one by one, the important ones. Now, what is the role of radiation exposure and what type of radiation exposure can lead to basal cell carcinoma? Sunlight, particularly chronic exposure of the sunlight is the most frequent association. It's a chronic exposure. And the risk correlate with the amount and nature of accumulated exposure. Now, how do we explain that? Okay. Accumulated exposure means okay, repeated exposure. It's not one-time exposure. It's repeated. So there is a latency period of almost 20 to 50 years before we develop basal cell carcinoma. So uh, having said that, you know, there is a considerable gap between the sun exposure and basal cell carcinoma development. Not all people who are exposed to sun will develop basal cell carcinoma, okay? 
so there has to be some role of the gene as well now, both short wavelength ultraviolet b radiation that has the wavelength of 290 to 320 nanometer which are also known as sun burn rays and longer wavelength ultraviolet a radiation 320 to 400 nanometer which are called tanning rays okay they change the color of the skin contribute to the formation of basal cell carcinoma and if we compare between ultraviolet a and ultraviolet b ultraviolet b is believed to play a greater role than a because it is causing sun burn it is more damaging type of radiation than ultraviolet a now let me uh, let me repeat these things in few sentences here the most important point here according to uh, basal cell carcinoma etiology is accumulated exposure of the sun okay so if it 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 starts already from the childhood and more you expose yourself to the sun when you become older or when you reach middle age there is a chance of development of basal cell carcinoma and among two types of uh, radiation which is present in sunlight ultraviolet b is more damaging now what are the other okay gene mutation so recent studies demonstrate a high incidence of tp53 gene mutation in basal cell carcinoma this is one of the example of gene mutation and the ultraviolet sunlight play a important role in the genesis of this mutation I mean it play a important role in this mutation itself so again it demonstrate the importance of sun exposure in causation of basal cell carcinoma now apart from sun exposure even x-ray exposure is associated with basal cell carcinoma formation and that is very common in the inside the hospital or in the healthcare industry okay x-ray exposure is very common there so if somebody is not taking precautions they are not protecting themselves they are just taking x-ray without anything like that then they can develop carcinoma later on another etiology may be arsenic exposure okay arsenic may be present in water in many areas of the world so if we do not check what is the content of arsenic in that water and easily you know drink it it can lead to cancer now another is immunosuppression now recipients of organ or stem cell transplant and patients with hiv and aids are immunosuppressed or immunocompromised people so the skin cancer incidence is tenfold higher in transplant patient than in general population this is a very important data tenfold higher means they are much more likely to develop basal cell carcinoma up to 65 to 75 percent of the patient with long-term immunosuppression develop skin cancer look at the percentage here this is a massive percentage okay now let me give you a little bit more knowledge here apart from skin cancer other type of cancers are also common in immunosuppressed condition and these are lymphoma lymphoma especially non hodgkin's lymphoma very common in immunosuppressed condition now some other can be xeroderma pigmentosum in the beginning we already talked about this this is autosomal recessive disorder okay this runs in the family as autosomal recessive disease which results in the inability to repair the dna damage i already gave you the explanation in the beginning of this topic now what is happening because of the sun exposure this ultraviolet light array in the sun these are ultraviolet b and ultraviolet a light they are constantly damaging our skin cell which are called keratinocyte now if we already have this defect means we have inability to repair the dna damage caused by ultraviolet exposure we are in trouble this leads to mutation okay this leads to the development of cancer the pigmentary change see this pigmentosum the pigmentary change are seen early in life followed by the development of bcc squamous cell carcinoma 
and malignant melanoma. All three types of skin cancers can occur in xeroderma pigmentosum. Apart from there, other features can also occur, like opacities of the cornea. Okay, they may lose vision as well. Eventual blindness can occur. That is the reason. Now, cornea is a transparent area of our eyeball, and through cornea, light enters inside. So, if cornea is opacified, the person cannot see, which is called blindness. And some neurological deficit can also occur in xeroderma pigmentosum. So, remember. So some of the clinical situation regarding xeroderma pigmentosum can be given in your exam and then certain questions can be asked. Now another one, a very serious type of condition is epidermodysplasia verruciformis. Now this is also hereditary condition. It is autosomal recessive disorder which is characterized by the development of basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma both and in this condition numerous okay numerous human papilloma virus lesions occur on the body this is the most severe type of hpv infection you can ever think of this doesn't look good at all and later on it can develop into malignancy as well so these are some of the etiology of basal cell carcinoma now let's talk about clinical feature how this patient present the common symptoms of these patients are slowly enlarging lesion let me underline slowly enlarging lesion that doesn't heal and that bleeds when traumatized this is a very very important point here many people will tell exactly this complaint when they come to the hospital they say, doctor, I am having this lesion for many months. It doesn't heal. And when I touch accidentally there, it will bleed. And it is slowly getting bigger and bigger these days. Very typical feature. Now, okay, the most common area is face. We all know that. So their patient may give the history of an acne bump that occasionally bleed. Patient thinks this is acne or acne vulgaris but they are wrong this is not acne okay this is a tumor or malignancy which is occurring there consider basal cell carcinoma in any patient with a history of sore or skin anomaly that doesn't heal within three to four weeks and which occurs on sun exposed skin now what does that mean the skin is already having some problem and it is not going to heal in time and that skin has to be exposed part of our body okay like the face okay face forehead uh, a dorsal surface of the hand these are very common and sometimes they may be there may be depression in the middle which is called dimpling in the middle and these tumors may take many months or years to reach even one centimeter in diameter means they are quite small in size so these are very very important feature of uh, basal cell carcinoma they may be complained from the patient okay while they presented to the hospital now what we get when we examine the patient what are the physical examination finding here now the characteristic feature of basal cell carcinoma tumors include the following waxy papule with central depression okay the centrally depressed lesion okay with the waxy type of papule pearly appearance okay a little bit whitish appearance erosion or ulceration upon central that means the central part of the lesion is ulcerated or eroded bleeding when traumatized this is easy bleeding some crust may be formed on the surface and many of these crusts are because of necrotic material. If we examine the border or edge of this uh, ulcer, it may be rolled or raised from the surface. This is a very important feature of malignancy because they are rapidly proliferating cell. And any cells which are rapidly proliferating, okay, they may raise from the surface. There may be dilated blood vessels over the surface, which is called telangiectasia. 
dilated blood vessel and these are very slow growing tumor now let's see uh, some of the picture along with the description now see here look at this very carefully here okay this area is having problem this area the lower eye lead is having the lesion it is very small size and in this case the upper eye lead is having the lesion it almost looks like uh, you know stipe in the beginning or even calagion in the beginning these are lesions of the eye lead and these are very benign lesion these are caused by infection or obstruction of the gland but if it persists for a long long time many months we can think of vessel cell carcinoma now Basal cell carcinoma occur mostly on the face, okay, head, the scalp is included there, neck and hand because these are the commonly exposed area on the sun. It rarely develops on the palms and soul. The lesion is not painful. This is very important point. It is not painful and it grows very slowly and it doesn't itch. These are the important features. On physical exam a periocular tumor most commonly involve the lower eyelid followed by the medial canthus the upper eyelid and the lateral canthus now let me go back to that picture again and explain to you now see that so what do we mean by these different terms which i just discussed to you so see there this is lower eyelid okay lower eyelid upper eyelid upper eyelid medial canthus where these two eyelid meet is medial canthus where these two eyelids meet on the lateral side is the lateral canthus so these are the common site now several different clinical pathological types of basal cell carcinoma exist these are nodular variety or nodular type these may be cystic pigmented are hyperkeratotic cystic we all know there is fluid filled pigmented okay it may look of different color especially blacker and keratotic okay different flecking are present there on the surface infiltrative it is going deeper or in the nearby structure okay infiltration is one of the um, you know important feature of malignancy micronodular small nodule type morpheiform means sclerosing or fibrosing morpheiform sclerosing or fibrosing type and superficially spreading type so these are the different you know way by which basal cell carcinoma present now let's explain this with the help of pictures see here okay this is nodular basal cell carcinoma you see this nodule here this is called waxy appearance a small bumpy appearance okay and it looks a little bit whitish so waxy appearance okay a little bit like a translucent papule with a central depression you can see central depression okay this is called nodular form of basal cell carcinoma now let me uh, you know remind you once again if this type of lesion occurs on our face anywhere it doesn't uh, you know disappear even after many weeks or many month think about basal cell carcinoma and send this patient uh, for the biopsy now this is a superficial basal cell carcinoma see this it is superficial spreading type okay superficial spreading probably it, it has not gone very deep so it is a bit of scaly if i look very carefully some scales are present there it looks erythematous or red okay and the borders are raised from the surface so superficial type another is pigmented type okay pigmented type you see there now it is very easily confused with malignant melanoma because malignant melanoma also looks like this 
So biopsy has to be taken to differentiate between them. Now another is called infiltrating. Okay, infiltrating type. You see there, this is even very difficult to identify. Where is the tumor or cancer here? I need to see it very carefully, and I can see some dilated blood vessel on the surface. You can clearly see here. Uh, these are called telangiectasia. And now see it very carefully. On this area, a little bit red lesion is present because this cancer is infiltrating deeper inside. This is called infiltrating basal cell cancer. Now, another one is morpheiform. Morpheiform is a scar like basal cell cancer. Now, see this, this area. Okay. It looks and look like an scar, but if I if I pay attention well, I can still see some dilated blood vessels on the surface. Dilated blood vessels are there, and this is the this is the age of that scar-like malignancy. This is the age. So this is morpheiform or sclerosing type of basal cell carcinoma. Now this is the histology of basal cell carcinoma. Now, please take a bit of time and see there, okay? Now, where are these malignant cells present here? Okay, see here, please. Where are the malignant cells present? So, of course, let me describe you from the very beginning. This is called stratum corneum. This is the outermost layer of the skin. Stratum corneum, it is developing different flecking. Now slowly we are going downwards, okay? Probably the other layers are, so you already know the names, isn't it? What are the names? Stratum uh, corneum is the topmost layer. And after that, stratum granulosum, stratum spinosum, and stratum basal, okay? Probably this, is not stratum lucidum here, okay? I cannot see stratum lucidum in this case. This is stratum granulosum, granular looking cell, stratum spinosum. And the last or the bottom layer is stratum basal, from where basal cell carcinoma are originated. Now, this is the area of stratum basal, and these are the cancer area. Look at the number of cells here, so many, numerous, okay? And as some of the cancer cells are already gone into the dermis. It has already infiltrated the dermis. Now, have a look at this picture. Okay, this is a very, very important picture which can be asked in different exam. Now, look at the margin of this. This, this area, air A's or margin is rolled or elevated from the surface. But the central part of this ulcer is badly eroded it is known as rodent ulcer, okay, rodent ulcer. So this rodent ulcer is, is very uh, advanced type of basal cell carcinoma. I can see some areas of necrosis, okay, some areas, areas of bleeding, and the edge of this lesion is elevated from the surface. Now, you may be wondering why it is called rodent ulcer, because uh, there is no specific reason, okay? Just uh, looks like a very bad uh, looking ulcer, probably bitten by some animal or sometimes even the rat. So rodent type of ulcer, okay? So I'm making things a little bit easy for you, okay? Actually, this is not bitten by the rat here. That is not my meaning. But it is such a bad type of cancer that it is infiltrating that area, okay? And it is going deeper and deeper. Now, some important points regarding basal cell carcinoma are, though it can erode the local area, it doesn't go to any lymph node. It doesn't go to distant area. It doesn't have any features of metastasis. This is a very good point regarding the prognosis of basal cell carcinoma. So let me stop here. We'll we'll continue tomorrow. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank sir. you, sir. Mm.
Okay, good morning everyone. So let's continue. We are talking about uh, basal cell carcinoma in the last lecture. So we discussed everything regarding it. We started with the causes or etiology of basal cell carcinoma. Okay, what is the importance of sun exposure in the causation, followed by some other important risk factor. Then we examine the patient of uh, basal cell carcinoma, and then uh, uh, we have reached to the treatment part. Let's let's continue for today. Now, the recommended treatment modality of basal cell carcinoma or any type of skin cancer is mainly surgery. Okay, surgery, but surgery is not the only treatment option. We have chemotherapy as well as radiotherapy. All three types of modalities can be used. The surgical approach varies according to the tumor size, tumor depth, and tumor location. Now, one of the uh, important surgical technique, a surgical way, is called Mohs surgery. Now, this Mohs surgery uh, means thin layers of the cancer-containing skin are progressively removed, and they are examined until only cancer-free tissue remains behind. So it is layer by layer, you know, they will remove the skin and uh, remove those cancer containing cells. Mm. And they will continue that until they remain that layer where there are no cancer. So this is a very good uh, type of surgery. It is also known as most micrographic surgery. Now, Apart from this, we also have some of the chemotherapeutic and immune modulating agents, and we apply them there, okay, in case of lesion of basal cell carcinoma. They are tropical 5% imiquimod. This uh, imiquimod is a immunomodulating type of drug. It can be used for the treatment of non facial superficial basal cell carcinoma, which are less than 2 cm in diameter. Just remember, it is one of the options. Likewise, topical fluorouracil is another drug which can be tried. Okay, it is administered twice daily for three to six weeks. This fluorouracil, you have already heard this name, is one of the anti-neoplastic or anti-cancer drug. Now, the third option is radiation therapy or radiotherapy. Now, if those people who are not fit for surgery, then this radiation therapy may be used. Now, one of the important contraindications for radiation therapy is genetic condition which produce post risk skin cancer, like xeroderma pigmentosum. Xeroderma pigmentosum. Okay? In this condition, probably radiation therapy is contraindicated because <clears throat> as a result of sun exposure, a lot of those keratinocyte may get mutated in xeroderma pigmentosum. Okay, on top of that, what you are doing here, you are giving more radiation exposure to the patient that can even more damaging for the body. So surgery is the best option in this type of person. Now, what is the prognosis of basal cell carcinoma or uh, what is the prognostic importance of each of these treatment part? The prognosis for a patient with basal cell carcinoma is excellent with a 100% survival rate for cases that have not spread to other site. And the chance of spread to other site is very, very, very minimal. Okay, very minimal. Though it is a malignant tumor, we all know the, the important properties of malignant tumor. Uh, local invasion and distal metastasis. This is one of the exception. Okay, remember like that. It rarely metastasizes. It has a property of local invasion or locally destructive, but it rarely metastasizes. That's why there is hundred percent survival rate. Okay, now let's continue. What is the you know, five year recurrence rate, okay, for basal cell carcinoma, which has treated by this type of treatment. 
Now, a little bit of uh, concept you get from here. The following is a list of treatment and their five-year recurrence rate for uh, primary previously untreated, that means basal cell carcinoma. After surgical excision, the five-year recurrence rate is 10.1. So still, there is a chance, okay? There is a chance. But this surgical excision is not most micrographic surgery. This is a, another type of surgery, okay? Not that microscopic surgery. It is a bit of macroscopic type, means random tissues are removed. Radiation therapy also has a five-year recurrence rate of around 9%. Curetage and electrodesiccation. This is a destruction of the tissue by electric pottery. Almost 8% chance of recurrence in five years. Cryotherapy has 8% chance of recurrence. This is cold therapy. All non-most modalities have almost 9%. Whereas most micrographic surgery has just 1% chance of five-year recurrence rate. That's why it is an excellent type of treatment in case of basal cell carcinoma. So this question can be asked in different exams. Please remember the name, most micrographic surgery. Okay, let me underline this for you. Most micrographic surgery is the best way of treatment of basal cell carcinoma. Now with this, Okay, we have concluded basal cell carcinoma. Let's enter into the squamous cell carcinoma of the skin, also known as cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. Now, this is the second most common skin cancer after basal cell carcinoma. It is more common than melanoma, but it is less common than basal cell carcinoma. What are the etiology? There are well-known risk factor for the cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. And uh, what you have to do here is just compare the risk factor of basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma together. Okay? Ultraviolet radiation exposure is the same one. Immunosuppression, same one. Exposure to ionizing radiation or chemical carcinogen, same one. And human papilloma virus infection, also same one. See here. So most of the risk factor are similar in basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. Now, there is one a bit of um, a difference probably. In case of squamous cell carcinoma, the chronic ultraviolet radiation exposure, like tanning bed, okay? Many people who have got fair skin or white skin, they want to turn or change their skin into a tan color, okay? That is quite damaging. That is very damaging actually. And that may result in development of squamous cell carcinoma. Medical ultraviolet treatment, like phototherapy chamber or phototherapy unit, or cumulative lifetime sun exposure in the whole lifetime, there are many, uh, they are most important risk factor for cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. So cumulative means additive, okay? Uh, it, it adds, it keeps on added there. Uh, throughout the lifetime. And later on, they may develop squamous cell carcinoma. Now, squamous cell carcinoma of the skin is very common in those countries who are, which are proximity the geographical equator. Now, uh, we all know equator of our uh, earth and those countries which are near, are exactly there at the equator or equatorial region a very high chance of squamous cell carcinoma. And this can be explained by high exposure of sun in those areas. So there are more chance of sunburn in those people. If history of precancerous lesion or prior skin cancer, it has got more chance. Older age, more chance because of cumulative exposure and male sex predispose an individual to the development of squamous cell carcinoma more commonly than the female. So out of them, the most important is a, a proximity to equatorial region. Okay, please uh, mute yourself. Now other well-known marker for ultraviolet radiation vulnerability include fair skin, okay, 
uh, in those people whose skin is fair than those people whose skin is brown to black the chance is much higher because fair skin individual have less amount of melanin present on the skin okay that melanin is protective we all know that but in these people it is not there so there is high chance of mutation and development of cancer albinism same explanation i can give here albinism okay. melanocytes are there but they are not synthesizing melanin so the protection given by melanin is not there okay if this albino if they expose themselves to the sunlight without covering themselves then there is a high chance of development of skin cancer now, what else what are the other etiological factor we call these as dermatosis and this dermatosis means skin diseases or disorder like xeroderma pigmentosum uh, same like uh, uh, basal cell carcinoma it can also give rise to melanoma all three skin cancers are commonly seen in xeroderma pigmentosum patient epidermal dysplasia verruciformis okay severe type of autosomal recessive disorder where okay innumerable viral warts are present on the body these viral wart they can complicate into basal cell carcinoma as well as squamous cell carcinoma now there is another condition known as dyskeratosis congenita or dyskeratosis congenital the meaning is uh, in this condition okay there is degeneration of skin cells degeneration a death of the skin cell at the same time there is dystrophy of the nail as well dystrophy of the nail at the same time even bone marrow may be suppressed so failure or suppression of bone marrow okay degeneration of skin cells as well as dystrophy of the nail these are the features of dyskeratosis congenita it is considered one of the precancerous condition regarding squamous cell carcinoma of the skin now xeroderma pigmentosum i already explained in the last class in this condition there is multiple pigmentation on the skin there is lack of dna repair so even with a bit of sun exposure they have high chance of development of multiple skin cancer another very important etiology is marzolin ulcer now what is this marzolin ulcer now look at the causes of marzolin ulcer here burn scar or thermal injury any chronic scar in the skin venous ulcer and lymphedema now all of these either cause ulceration on the skin or scar formation on the skin in other word they cause chronic wound on the skin now when this chronic wound is healing sometime it may develop marzolin ulcer there this marzolin ulcer is just another name for developing cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma don't forget this this is a very important question in different exam i want to give you one small example here chronic osteomyelitis okay chronic osteomyelitis in the patient can give marzolin ulcer and that marzolin ulcer is squamous cell carcinoma because that chronic osteomyelitis can develop ulceration chronically on the skin because the, the discharge may come out uh, on the skin though it is a disease of bone but skin can be affected now with this let's talk about clinical presentation of squamous cell carcinoma of skin regarding the symptom the initial presentation of squamous cell carcinoma typically includes a history of a non healing ulcer or abnormal growth in a sun exposed area see here so it includes a history of a non healing ulcer or abnormal growth in a sun exposed area so it is also develop very commonly in a sun exposed part maybe face maybe dorsal surface of the hand or maybe uh, the back of the neck and other areas now 
features that suggest peripheral nerve involvement by the tumor like local pain okay local pain numbness twitching or muscle weakness and if it involves the face okay even visual changes should be asked now these all are either local invasion property as well as local metastatic property of the tumor now unlike basal cell carcinoma squamous cell carcinoma of the skin can metastasize commonly to the regional lymph nodes and from there even you know a bit far away so it is common here so these are the symptoms which should be asked local pain again because of local invasion of the nearby structure numbness because of the involvement of sensory nerve twitching or muscle weakness because of the involvement of the motor nerve and visual changes because of the involvement of orbit or eye now look at this picture here now this person okay this person is having this ulcer here look at the edge of the ulcer it is elevated okay from the other skin this is called hip top margin this occurs because of rapid proliferation of the cells in this area and look at the central part okay there is a necrotic tissue i can see and this is because of hemorrhage probably okay so this is a uh, typically uh, seen in cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma but if you are confused with basal cell carcinoma the best thing you can do is take a biopsy from the edge of the ulcer and a look under the microscope you can easily uh, differentiate between squamous cell carcinoma and basal cell carcinoma now let's talk about some more physical examination finding approximately 70% 70% of all cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma occur on the head and neck area so this is a big percentage more than two third of the cases occur on head and neck area remember basal cell carcinoma it also occur in the same area most frequently it involve the lower lip okay, lower lip external ear and peri auricular region means around the external ear or forehead and the scalp now let's write these areas once again see here the lower eyelid okay lower eyelid very common now when that lower eyelid is uh, involved we need to know what is the size how big is it okay you need to measure it and then during the examination just palpate that area wear a glove and feel it what is the character of that ulcer whether it is smooth or nodular okay whether it bleeds easily or not what is the color all these things you need to examine and what are the degrees of scaling or crusting or even ulceration all these things are quite important during examination now one of the important feature of malignant looking ulcer is hip top edges this means overhanging with irregular border and the easy explanation for this is it is rapidly growing lesion that's why the the edge of the ulcer are elevated from the surface this gives rise to hipped up edges now let's see uh, some of the picture here look at this okay this is lower eyelid lower eyelid okay upper eyelid look at this area here exactly this side i can say small nodule here okay and a small breakage probably this area is abnormal this area is abnormal we need to confirm it by the biopsy now, this is already advanced type of ulceration has formed look at the floor of the ulcer it is necrotic so this is called necrotic tissue and if you see carefully the edge of the ulcer is raised from the surface this is called hipped up margin the same patient is already having a small another ulcer on the inner canthus of the eye as well this area okay 
So this area and this area both are cancerous. Now, clinically, uh, lesions of squamous cell carcinoma in C2. Okay, squamous cell carcinoma in C2. We have got a term for this. This is called Bowen's disease. Bowen's disease. Oh, this Bowen's disease, okay, may range from scaly or pink patch to a thin keratotic papule or plaque which is similar to an actinic keratosis. Now, see here, there is a variability of presentation of Bowen's disease. It may look scaly on the surface. It just look like a pink patch or it looks like a plaque, which is similar to an actinic keratosis, means sunburn. This is a lesion uh, which appears on the skin because of chronic exposure to the sun. Till now, there is no cancer here, but it can quickly develop into cancer later on okay this is called precancerous lesion actinic keratosis quite common in older people now what i'm saying here squamous cell carcinoma in c2 is called bowen disease now this bowen's disease is a subtype of squamous cell carcinoma in c2 and it can develop in sun exposed or even on non-sun exposed skin definitely in sun exposed there's no doubt at all it is very common because of the exposure to the sun but even in non-sun exposed skin or area, uh, this type of malignancy may develop. Let me highlight once again, the basement membrane is not at breach in case of Bowen disease. It is not yet infiltrated. It is still intact. All the malignant cells are present above the basement membrane. Look at this picture here. This is the area we are talking about. Okay, this whole area. Now nobody, nobody can suspect this is a case of Bowen's disease here because it looks like a plaque. It looks like a bit like a fungal infection as well. Okay, so the best thing we can do is take a biopsy from here, rule out all other differential diagnosis, and then you can reach to the confirmatory one. Now, how we know the tumor has metastasized and which are the common sites for tumor metastasis? Preauricular, submandibular, and cervical lymph nodes are the common site. Now, remember, almost 70% of the tumor uh, is present in the head and neck area. So these are the regional lymph nodes there. Preauricular lymph node, submandibular lymph node, and upper cervical lymph node. In two to six percent of cases of cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, the regional metastasis occur. So it's still not that very common in comparison to other type of cancer. It is still less, but much more common than basal cell carcinoma. Now, in general, metastasis from forehead, temporal area, eyelid, cheek, and ear first goes to the parotid node okay and carcinoma of the lips and perioral region is primarily going to the submental and submaxillary node okay. submental and submaxillary submaxillary also known as upper cervical node also known as submandibular okay it is the same type of forms now uh, let's see uh, one important picture here and try to understand what are we talking about See here now. Now these are the two arrows here. Okay, one arrow is a bit black, other is white. Now there is a there is a scar here. Okay, you can see a scar which is shown by the black arrow, and probably they have done some surgery in this area prior in this patient, but uh, some of the cells have already advanced into the lymph node. So later on, this patient has developed metastasis. So see here, this is a lymph node enlargement here. This is a typical example of metastasis in squamous cell carcinoma. From here, this is the original site of the malignancy. 
this lymph node is affected. Now, when we palpate this lymph node, okay, this lymph node is hard. It is uh, not painful. Remember, it is not painful, but it is hard. And in the late stages, it is immobile, means it is fixed there. We cannot move it. It is stony hard. These are important features of metastatic lymph node. Now, if we take a biopsy from this area and analyze under the microscope, what are the findings? See here, look here carefully. Now, this is epidermis. See, this whole area up to here is epidermis. Okay, this area is epidermis. This area is dermis. This is dermis. These are the cancer cell or malignant cell. Now they are, uh, you know, occupying the whole of the epidermis in this area. See here, it is reaching up, high up towards the skin. In comparison to basal cell carcinoma, they are mainly localized in the basal area of the skin. So this is one of the important difference. Basal cell carcinoma is localizing towards the basal area. Squamous cell cell carcinoma is usually uh, occupying the whole of the epidermis. And this has not across the basement membrane, so it is known as carcinoma in situ. So here I cannot see any any large type of malignant cells gone towards the dermis. These are probably the inflammatory cells which are present there. Now another one, okay. Uh, now it is clearly tell you uh, what type of histopathological slide is this. Now, this is invasive type of squamous cell carcinoma, okay? invasive type. Now, I can see uh, this squamous, uh, uh, you know, carcinomatous cell everywhere in the dermis. It's in the epidermis, it has started, but it is everywhere now. Along with that, even inflammatory cells are present. So, this is a invasive cancer now. What is the treatment we give? To this type of patient, what type of therapy is necessary? Now, any cancer, if this question is asked, you can answer in the same way. We can destroy that uh, tumor or cancer by surgery, okay, electro desiccation or electro curatas. Another one, uh, radiotherapy as well as chemotherapy. Now, electro desiccation and curatas is one of the options. And it can be used to treat low risk squamous cell carcinoma on the trunk and the extremity. Now, what is this procedure all about? It is destroying the tumor. It is destroying the tumor in that area. Oops, here, it destroys the tumor and a surrounding margin of clinically unaffected tissue. So it is. it should always be done whenever you do surgery or some procedure which are like surgery. Uh, don't only, you know, uh, take out the affected area. Give a small margin of unaffected area as well and remove that too so that uh, no cancer cell will be left behind. That is the principle. The process is repeated several times until and unless you are quite sure that no more uh, tumor cells are left. Now, another one is a proper surgical incision or excision, I should say, proper surgical excision and the generally accepted five-year cure rate for primary tumor treated with standard excision is 92%. So this is a very good you know, uh, result. 92% is a five-year cure rate after standard excision. But let me remind you once again, during this standard excision, okay, the tumor is definitely removed, there is no doubt, but even a margin of healthy skin uh, also should be removed. If this is turned into recurrent squamous cell carcinoma of the skin, then the five-year cure rate will drop to 77%. 
Another option we have is radiation therapy. Now, this is a primary type of treatment, okay, which is typically reserved for those patients who are unable to undergo surgical excision. Like some very old patients who are not fit for surgery, okay, like COPD, which is uncontrolled, uncontrolled diabetes, severe bronchial asthma, severe renal diseases, liver diseases. They are not fit for anesthesia are not fit for surgery. So radiation therapy is the better option for them. Now, what is the role of chemotherapy here? Adjuvant chemotherapy and systemic chemotherapy. They have divided into two types of two heading. The adjuvant chemotherapy means uh, along with some other treatment, this chemotherapy are used. So they are not the main type of therapy. That's why they are called adjuvant. And options include oral 5-fluorouracil and epidermal growth factor receptor inhibitor. Epidermal growth factor receptor inhibitor. One of the example is cetuximab. Okay, cetuximab. So 5-fluorouracil and cetuximab. Regarding the systemic chemotherapy, the most commonly used drugs are cisplatinum and carboplatinum, 5 fluorouracil again, and taxin. These are the names of chemotherapeutic agent which can be tried in the treatment of squamous cell carcinoma. Now, what's the prognosis? Remember, in basal cell carcinoma, okay, the prognosis is reaching almost 100%, means that that uh, cancer doesn't kill the patient. What about in squamous cell carcinoma? The association of tumor depth with survival rate has been reported as follows. Less than 2 millimeter tumor depth, there is 95% survival rate. So it's still excellent one. From 2 to 9 millimeter tumor depth, we have 80% survival rate. And larger than 9 millimeter, the survival rate drops to 65 or even lesser than that. Now you may understand here why the tumor depth is causing decreased survival rate, isn't it? The answer is very easy. Now this tumor is originating from epidermis. After crushing the basement membrane, it goes towards the dermis and in that dermis, we have blood vessels. We have lymphatic channel, we have got nerves. So especially lymphatic channels and blood vessels are eroded or affected. Eroded or affected. And that will lead to high chance of metastasis earlier in the lymphatic or regional lymphadenopathy and later on from there to other distant area. But still in comparison to uh, other types of malignancy, Cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma has less chance of metastasis, so less chance of mortality. Okay, so uh, let me uh, revise a little bit before I go to the melanoma here. So what we have studied today, we talked about cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. We started with the uh, risk factor. The risk factor are almost similar to the basal cell carcinoma that is chronic sun exposure. This is called cumulative sun exposure in case of uh, squamous cell carcinoma. Especially tanning type of bed, in, and if, if the persons are exposing themselves for longer time, in the beach usually, you know, somebody wants to tan their skin, those are highly damaging for the skin cell. Some other uh, risky conditions are xeroderma pigmentosum, dyskeratosis congenita, and epidermal dysplasia of the rupiformis. So all these are important ones. Now regarding the clinical features, the most common site which is affected is head and neck area in 70% of the time. And usually this malignancy causes ulcer formation on the affected area and the edge of the ulcer is hipped up from the surface. The base is covered by necrotic tissue. It has chance of a regional lymphadenopathy as well. So these are important point okay
Okay, so let's start freshly after the break. Uh, before the break, we talk about squamous cell carcinoma of the skin. Now let's talk about the last part of the malignancy of the skin, that is melanoma, also known as malignant melanoma. Now, among among the severity, okay, if I compare what is the severity rate of all three skin cancer, melanoma is the most severe one, or it has got the poorest prognosis among all. This is how I like to start this topic. Melanoma is a highly malignant tumor which originates from melanocyte. This melanocyte okay, are originating from neural crest cells. Neural crest cells. Now see there, these neural crest cells are the derivative of epidermis and they are uh, present inside the nervous system and they are migrating to the different parts of our body from there and they develop into different type of cells. Some of the examples are given here, epidermis, okay? and uh, they migrate to the epidermis, okay? and then they give rise to melanocyte. They are, uh, these melanocytes are also present in the uvia, okay? meninges and ectodermal mucosa. So what do you mean by that? Melanoma may develop from any of the site. This is the epidermis means skin. That's what we are talking right now. So naturally, the most common site is skin. But don't be surprised if melanoma is developed from the uveal tract also, from the meninges also, or from any other ectodermal mucosa. For example, uh, vagina, the lower uh, third of the vagina has ectoderm, isn't it? We have studied that. Esophagus has ectoderm. Okay. Most of the thing which are uh, squamous cell uh, as an epithelium are derived from ectoderm. So uh, logically speaking, um, melanoma can develop from those sites also, though it is very, very rare. Some exceptional cases have been reported. Now the melanocyte, which is present in the stratum basal or basal layer of the epidermis, from there, the melanoma originate in the skin. Now let's talk about growth of melanoma. There are two uh, different you know, direction where it will go. One is called radial direction, another is called vertical direction. We also call it radial growth phase and vertical growth phase in case of melanoma. Now radial means it is going on the side, okay, from the uh, tumor area. It is going uh, circumferentially, you can say, all around, okay, but not vertically deeper. It is going towards the edge. Whereas vertical growth phase means the malignant cell invade the basement membrane first, and they will go into the dermis. And then from the dermis, they can go to lymphatics as well as hematogenous way anywhere. They can go anywhere. One of the commonest organ is brain metastasis in case of melanoma. Many cases have been reported. The central nervous system metastasis and there is high chance of death. Now clinically, the lesions are classified according to their depth. You can see it here now. Thin one millimeter or less, moderate, one to four millimeter, and thick is more than four millimeter. So if less than one millimeter or up to one millimeter, we call it okay, thin lesion, moderate lesion one to four, thick lesion means more than four, and they have got very poor prognosis. Now, after this, let's talk about the histological types of melanoma. Now, there are five different forms of malignant melanoma according to the histology. They are superficial spreading melanoma, which is the most common one. Okay, I have collected some of the picture. We can see this, let me do this first. Another variety is called nodular melanoma. Okay, it is elevated from the surface and it looks rounded in shape like a nodule. When you palpate, it is quite firm also. Lentigo maligna melanoma means 
Now, first you need to understand what do you mean by this term lentigo or lentiginous. Now, lentigo or lentiginous means these are the brown patch, okay, brownish patch present on the skin. Uh, especially when somebody gets older, uh, these uh, brown patches are present in more number on the skin. And this lentigo malignant means that brown patch has turned into a type of melanoma but it has not crossed the basement membrane. So you can consider this as a melanoma in situ in case of malignant melanoma. This is called lentigo maligna. Okay, lentigo maligna. Another is called acral lentiginous. Now this freckle or brownish patches or plaque, they are present on the palm, sole, and even on the nail bed palm sole and nail bed that's why we use the term acral there acral means extremity okay so palm sole and nail bed in these uh, you know areas uh, the a type of melanoma may occur which is the lacral sorry acral lentiginous lentiginous is again a little bit brownish color patch or freckle mucosal lentiginous now inside the mucosa similar type of lesion may occur in the mucosa so superficial spreading which is the most common one nodular melanoma okay lentigo maligna acral lentiginous and mucosal lentiginous these are the different one now what are the site other than the skin so in the you know first slide of melanoma i have already told about this wherever melanocytes are present melanoma can develop there and these melanocytes are originated from neural crest cells so those areas would be eyes okay especially in the uvea uveal tract of the eye okay any mucosa any mucosa which contains squamous epithelium okay like gi tract esophagus is one of the important example lower part of the rec, uh, anal canal is another example and genital urinary tract especially vagina and even the leptomeninges leptomeninges also has uh, some sort of melanocyte metastatic melanoma with an unknown primary site may be found in lymph node only now what do you mean by that sometimes lymph nodes are enlarged and a patient may come like that to the hospital when we examine that lymph node okay all the features of metastatic lymph nodes are present like it is very hard okay very hard like a stony hard a stony hard what else it is not mobile okay it is not painful isn't it even the overlying skin is attached there so all the features are like metastatic lymph node but we don't know the primary we need to search for it okay and if we do not know primary, then take a biopsy from that lymph node and analyze which type of cells are present inside the lymph node. That will give you a clear idea. And sometimes it may come from the melanoma or small melanotic lesion. So this is one of the presentation. Another part of discussion is staging. Now Clark staging and Breslow staging or Clark classification and Breslow classification. There are two, two ways. So see here, what is the meaning of this? According to the Clark staging, we have level one to level five. Level one means all tumor cells are present above the basement membrane. Okay. So let me underline this and explain in a nice way. Now all tumor cells are present above the basement membrane. So this is in situ, okay? Lentigo maligna is a perfect example here. Level two, tumor extends into the papillary dermis. Now, papillary dermis is the upper part of the dermis. We have papillary layer and reticular layer of the dermis. So, still the tumor cells are in papillary. Level three, okay. Level three, the tumor extends to the interface between papillary and reticular dermis. Now, it has reached the middle area. Level four means the tumor extends between the bundles of collagen of reticular dermis. It is definitely gone into the reticular dermis. 
and in reticular dermis there are lots of collagen there's a lot of blood vessels and nerves etc and level 5 tumor invasion of subcutaneous tissue now it has gone even beyond the reticular dermis and involve the subcutaneous tissue and in the subcutaneous tissue layer there are larger blood vessels there are larger lymphatics okay so it can go out of there very easily so this is the importance of knowing clark staging whereas breslow staging tells us okay this is the measurement 0.75 mm or less okay 0.76 to 1.5 mm 1.51 to 4 mm or 4 mm or more so these are the different uh, classification according to thickness and if we go uh, from 0.75 mm towards the 4 mm the prognosis will be severe or prognosis will be the worst now after knowing after knowing these uh, staging okay let's talk about what is the etiology of uh, malignant melanoma now there are certain certain risk factor or precursor lesion now this precursor lesion may be there in the patient already and some of them may change into melanoma so these include common acquired nevus dysplastic nevus congenital nevus and cellular blue nevus so see here all of these are different type of nevi okay among them this dysplastic nevi and congenital nevi are more uh, malignant than the other i mean to say there are more chance of conversion into melanoma than other and the size also matters if the size is bigger there is more chance the second important point here is genetics a genetic factor what are those genetic factors many genes are implicated in the development of melanoma but exactly what are those genes and you know these are uh, still under the study ultraviolet radiation just like any other skin cancer basal cell carcinoma squamous cell carcinoma and malignant melanoma all can be caused by ultraviolet exposure now this knowledge is not new for you ultraviolet ray has two different types of wavelength ultraviolet a and ultraviolet b a has a wavelength of 320 to 400 nanometer whereas ultraviolet b, b has a 290 to 320 nanometer and ultraviolet b is more carcinogenic or more harmful than ultraviolet a these are the important point now see here the ultraviolet radiation appears to be an effective inducer of melanoma through many mechanism and those are highlighted here one is suppression of the immune system of the skin it suppresses the immune system of the skin first thing second one it induces the melanocyte cell division okay third thing it stimulate free radical production on the skin and fourth it can damage the melanocyte dna as well so if somebody okay is exposed to the sunlight for a long time especially the blistering of amount of sunlight very hot uh, time of the day and they burn their skin under the sunlight then they can develop melanoma because of this mechanism now see here the same mechanism is highlighted once again because it is an important point acute intense and intermittent blistering sunburn this is sunburn especially on areas of the body okay, that only occasionally receive sun exposure are the greatest risk factor for the development of uh, sun exposure induced melanoma now for example we go to the beach okay we go to the beach and uh, our upper part of the body is exposed to the sun usually our back okay doesn't expose to the sun isn't it that's a rare type of mechanism because we we wear clothes all the time 
But during that time, we want to take a sun bath or something like that. We expose it. And if some person continuously okay, uh, expose themselves in the, this type of situation, if the sun is, you know, probably blistering type, then it may be one of the important risk factor for melanoma development. Now, I like to highlight the difference in sun exposure in three different types of cancer. Now, in basal cell carcinoma, okay, and squamous cell carcinoma, it is a cumulative or prolonged type of sun exposure, which is important. This, the effect of the sun exposure is remaining in the body in case of basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. And when those people get a bit older, then the cancer may develop. Whereas in melanoma, it is a intensive type of sun exposure. It is a blistering type of sun exposure that matters. Now, apart from them, uh, what are the other risk factors? Greatly elevated risk factors for cutaneous melanoma include the following. Changing mole. This is a very important point. So we should take a good history and we should ask the question. What was the color of the mole, you know, few weeks or few months ago? And since when you have noticed the change in color or change in size? This is a very important feature that that mole is transferring into uh, malignant melanoma. Dysplastic nevi in familial melanoma is another one. And more than 50 nevi in a patient and 2 millimeter or greater in diameter is itself a greatly uh, increased risk factor for melanoma development. So more than 50 nevi, there's lots of nevi in, in the patient body. And if the size of them are two millimeter or more, they itself, okay, they themselves, I should say, are a great risk factors. Now, another one is moderately elevated risk factors. What are those? One family member with melanoma, previous history of melanoma, and congenital nevus. Now, congenital nevus, it is present from the time of birth. Okay, it, it may be considered as a birth mark in some of the area. It is also a moderately elevated risk factor for the development of malignant melanoma. Now, what are the clinical presentation or what are the clinical features? We should take a good family history. All family members should be asked about this question, whether there is history of melanoma or skin cancer in them, because 10% of all patients will have positive family history. Another one, also a family history of irregular prominent mole is important. Who knows that mole is changing into melanoma. So in the beginning, it is just a mole. Okay, later on, it may change into melanoma. And important points, there are color change and the size change. Or sometimes it become itchy as well. Normally, nevi are not itchy. But if it's become itchy, if it is changing its color, and if it is rapidly becoming bigger in size, these are very important points that it is changing into a melanoma. Now, past history, any previous history of melanoma must be elicited from the patient. Now, history of sun exposure should be asked. Okay, this is one of the important risk factor. So we always ask this question, especially severe sunburn in childhood or in early adulthood. We should ask this question. Many people uh, are positive for that type of history. Okay, examine about the mole now. So many times I've highlighted this point in today's class because it is absolutely necessary. Any history of change in size of the mole, color of the mole, or symmetry of the mole, as well as knowledge of bleeding or ulceration of the lesion must be obtained. And these are the features which tells us this mole is changing into melanoma or cancer. Now, there is one important examination as a doctor we are going to do, okay? Now, what is that is skin examination. Let's talk about it. This is a take home messages from this topic of melanoma. 
And this is one of the very important question we are going to ask to you. Now, during a skin examination, okay, let me explain this. During a skin examination, assess the total number of nevi present on the patient's skin. Now, if the total number are present more than 50, and if an individual size is more than two millimeter or even more, there is absolutely high chance of development of melanoma. We already know that. Attempts should be done to differentiate between typical and atypical lesions. Now, how we do that? Okay, see here. The ABCDs for differentiating early melanoma from benign nevi include the following. Okay, A, B, C, and D. Okay, so here A means asymmetry. Asymmetry. Melanoma lesion more likely to be asymmetrical than the benign nevus. Asymmetrical. Okay, you already know the meaning. B, border irregularity. Now, border irregularity, you have to clearly inspect that area as well as feel that area. And melanoma is more likely to have irregular border. Probably it is uh, more, you know, enlarged on one side than the other. C stands for color. Now, melanoma are more likely to be very dark black or blue, and sometimes they have variation in color, okay? Variation in color than would a benign mole. Benign mole is a uniform in color and they are light tan or brown. Whereas malignant melanoma are different in color of the same lesion. In some area, it may look red. Other area, it may be look very dark black or dark blue. Okay, So this is highly suspicious. And D stands for diameter. If the mole is less than six millimeter in diameter, okay, the individual mole we are talking about, then it is easily benign. Please don't get confused with more than two millimeter, which we discussed earlier. That more than two millimeter is applicable only when there are lots and lots of mole present on the patient's body. Okay. But if we talk about the individual mole, if it is less than six millimeter, there is a chance of benign. More than six millimeter, uh, maybe a chance of malignant. So this is called uh, ABCD during skin examination of melanoma patient. Let's move on. Now see some of the picture. Now see this area here, okay? Now look here, this whole area this whole area is highly suspicious. Look at the size here. Look at the diameter. It's quite, quite big. Okay, this is a superficial spreading type, and this is a bit of nodular type. Okay, the so combination is there. Now another one is a lentigo maligna melanoma. Now lentigo maligna, I already told you, is a, a malignant melanoma uh, in C2. The basement membrane is still not crossed. So it is considered as a early case of melanoma, lentigo maligna. In this case, it is present in the right lower cheek. Now, see here, okay, this looks like a bit like a nodular type, okay, elevated from the surface, definitely bigger in size, and this is the way we measure it. Now, how to confirm the diagnosis? The diagnosis of melanoma is, is confirmed by excisional biopsy. The biopsy should be taken from that area. And that is called excisional one. It means a complete uh, lesion is removed and sent to the lab. They will give us the report. Along with the complete lesion, okay, we should remove around one to three millimeter of healthy skin from the margin and some subcutaneous fat is also included there. Now, why we do that? Okay, the answer is very easy here because uh, the histopathologist or the pathologist, you should say, uh, should compare uh, how the 
abnormal cells and normal cells look like. Okay, this is a very important point for them. And they also try to find out what is the extent of local invasion if we take some normal skin, if we think, and if they are already invaded, then we know the cancer has already spread from that local area. So these are the different points. At the same time, do some other investigation as well, like complete blood count. Now, why we do complete blood count in this case? Any answer? Anybody? Yes, we are talking about malignant melanoma now. So what is the importance of doing CBC? Okay, so nobody is answering. Actually, the importance here is when the cancer is widespread, it can go anywhere. It can also go to the bone marrow. The answer is very easy. So bone marrow okay, may get suppressed or destroyed by the cancer cell leading to pancytopenia. ALT, AST and ALP, these are the liver enzyme, okay, which should be done because of uh, liver metastasis or urea and creatinine also can be done. Another reason I can give here is, these are liver function test and renal function test. They are always done before we start any chemotherapy okay, in, in the cancer. We need to make sure how the liver and, and kidneys are working. And this is one of the way we determine. Lactate dehydrogenase level is done to know what is the burden of tumor in the body. What is the burden of tumor in the body? We know by this type of investigation. And protein and albumin level is usually done to know what is the you know, nutritional level of the patient. Chest X-ray, CT scan and MRI can be done according to the metastasis. If you believe they have already gone into the lung, to chest x-ray and confirm it. If they have gone to the brain, then do CT scan or MRI because brain metastasis is one of the important problem in case of melanoma. Never forget this, one of the important question in the exam. Now the final part is the treatment. How we are going to treat this case? Now see here, surgery is the definitive treatment for early stage melanoma. We go for surgery. Wide local excision is done with sentinel lymph node biopsy or elective lymph node dissection is considered the mainstay of treatment for patient with primary melanoma. Now, let me explain this. What, what do you mean by sentinel lymph node biopsy? But till, till that time, probably we are not sure whether that lymph node is malignant or not. Okay, so still we take that lymph node out and send to the lab and ask them to confirm it. This is the meaning. If they are already involved, then do radical dissection of the lymph node. Remove all those lymph nodes which are suspicious. And so many times I explain this. Don't only remove the affected area. Involve a little bit of normal skin which is surrounding that area. This is a very important principle in the surgery of malignancy. Un interferon alpha is one of the drugs which can be tried. And in case of advanced stage melanoma, now advanced stage means it is already metastasized everywhere. Okay. Surgery is not the option now. It has already crossed the stage of surgery. So we can uh, take the help of chemotherapy mainly and even radiotherapy sometimes. Like these are the different treatment options. Dacarbazine, okay, this is one of the anti neoplastic drugs, interleukin 2, carboplatin, and, and paclitaxel, these are also anti neoplastic medicine. External beam radiation is a radiation therapy, and epilimumab, this is monoclonal antibody. So these are uh, different types of treatment options in advanced stage melanoma. So let me summarize this slide again. Surgery is the definitive treatment. If the patient comes early, we can uh, remove that area completely. Okay? There's high chance of survival. But if patient comes late, already metastasis has occurred most of the places, 
and treatment would be a challenging one so the prognosis would be poor now what is that prognosis now if detected early melanoma can be cured with surgical excision good prognosis we have superficial spreading and nodular types of melanoma are the two most common fatal melanoma okay. they are more common and they are fatal as well superficial spreading is the most common type whereas nodular because that nodular uh, may you know go a little bit deeper already and the more deeper it goes more chance of metastasis now what are the factors which predict the likelihood of response to treatment in case of melanoma they are the following so see that these are the factors which predict the likelihood of response to the treatment okay, so let's uh, uh, talk about them soft tissue disease or only a few visceral metastases only few visceral metastases they predict the likelihood of response by the treatment so they have good prognosis age younger than 65 years likelihood of response so good prognosis no prior chemotherapy good prognosis normal hepatic and renal function we can use most of those treatment which we are planning so probably they may work here normal complete blood cell count okay it shows the immunity is is good till now and the bone marrow is not affected absence of central nervous system metastasis is one of the most important point which tells us still it can be handled by the management it is not out of our hand it is still can be brought back to the normal life so these are all the different points okay so this is the end of the class at the end uh, i have prepared some questions this is a big topic remember we have started from uh, some pre malignant lesion or pre cancerous lesion on the skin and then we started the discussion of basal cell carcinoma so a lot of questions are from basal cell carcinoma here then we move on to the uh, squamous cell carcinoma and then the final part is malignant melanoma now let me highlight Uh, what are the common viva question uh, that may be asked from this topic one is list the pre malignant condition of the skin very common question now if uh, if some students are listening properly can you tell me what are the common pre malignant conditions of the skin yes uh, sir uh, ectenic keratosis okay bobbins disease mm -hmm. erythropoiesia of uh, quaret okay leukoplakia good and um, uh, dysplastic nevi exactly so he is absolutely correct so this is uh, one of the common question okay so make sure every student know this so actinic keratosis or solar keratosis is one of the common condition because of the sun induced damage of the skin okay followed by all all others which i have mentioned like bowen disease erythroplasia of quaret already squamous cell carcinoma has developed in situ in these two condition erythroplasia of quaret is a specific term we use for penile lesion only not in other area even some of the uh, hereditary conditions are precancerous like xeroderma pigmentosum one of the important one okay another common question is what is rodent ulcer yes this uh, answer should be given by another student what is rodent ulcer yes yunus uh, on stage of advanced stage of basal cell carcinoma good the extensive involvement of the skin mainly at uh, face region excellent And okay the deep very good you are absolutely correct so rodent ulcer is the advanced uh, you know also in case of basal cell carcinoma it may be involves the facial area and the nearby uh, you know structures are eroded it doesn't look good at all 
and the conformation is done by biopsy remember the term rodent ulcer advanced type of basal cell carcinoma okay now one one more question what are the histological subtype of melanoma which we have studied in today's class who can answer that to me histological types of melanoma yes anyone sir uh, superficial uh, spreading melanoma good uh lentigo malignant melanoma good uh acral lentigos yes yes and uh, mucosal lentiginous melanoma good okay and uh,